Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, now we are heading to the next session. This is an invited speaker session and uh, uh, I personally invited Perry Marshall to this talk and luckily uh, he's in the room like he made it to the conference in person and uh, I'm going to hand uh, this uh, floor to Perry and he has a very interesting talk. Uh, Perry, now the floor you. is yours. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here and I especially love it because we're in an environment where it's okay to question the foundations of science. And so uh, I'm going to uh, continue in that tradition today. Uh, my name is Perry Marshall. I'm from Chicago. I have a company called Evolution 2.0, which um, which has a conflict of interest that I need to disclose right away. We have a $10 million prize for the origin of information. Uh, and you could frame it as a search for um, the origin of the genetic code, but it's really a more general uh, question than that, as you will see as we go through the presentation. This is a picture of me with Dennis Noble, who you will hear from later today. He's one of the judges on the prize. And this is our announcement at the Royal Society three years ago, um, where we made the prize public. And um, we're, looking, we're looking for a uh, process that generates code or information from a non-living material without direct human agency. And we seek to turn that into a patent and buy it. So um, with that, let's get into this. So science, uh, as any philosopher of science knows, does not prove, it can only infer. Um, but to the but I, I'm going to show you a mathematical proof a little later on, and the only wiggle room in the proof is entropy. And so, to the extent that entropy is a valid concept, it is a proof, um, and it's a proof that biology has gotten cause and effect backwards 400 years. And the last speaker alluded to this, and it's a very big problem. And it also points the way to a very, very large major discovery, which I believe is as big as e equals mc squared or Newton's laws or anything like that. So in Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life, uh, which is now over 75 years old, he described the term negative entropy, which is the force that creates order from disorder. This is one of the great unsolved problems in biology because I believe he was correct, but we don't really know what this thing actually is. Um, negative entropy is negative inf information entropy. And uh, Claude Shannon, um, in his 1948 paper, made one of the most brilliant deductions uh, in science, which was realizing that the math of noise destroying a signal is the same as the math of toast getting uh, cold when it pops out of your toaster, which would absolutely brilliant observation. The math is the same. And negative entropy is the opposite of information entropy because it converts uncertainty into certainty and chaos into order. And that is a fascinating thing. And so one of the unsolved problems in biology is the origin of the genetic code. And you could frame that as a negative entropy problem. It is a negative information entropy problem. It's very easy to understand how an ordered signal degenerates into noise and becomes lost. But the question of how do you start with a soup or a universe or whatever and end up with a code, that is a uh, neg entropy problem. And in our prize um, specification, we point out that an information uh, system has uh, an input to an encoder, which converts it to a message, which is decoded into an output. And this is exactly what you find in DNA transcription and translation. Um, and you have an encoding table and a decoding table. Now, in biology, chemicals don't control information. Information controls chemicals. Um, as we know from how uh, 
amino acids and proteins are built um, from the genetic code. And um, Hubert Yaki pointed out in 2005 that the rules of codes cannot be derived from the laws of physics, which really gets to the heart of the mystery here. Another unsolved problem in biology is evolution, because natural selection is an outcome, it is not an explanation. If you say, well, where did you get an arm or where did you get an eye, and somebody says natural selection, that's like saying, how did Seattle win the Super Bowl, and somebody says, playoffs, and what was their defensive strategy? Playoffs, and uh, what was their recruiting strategy? Playoffs. It's not an answer. Well, more to the point, Barbara McClintock uh, damaged corn DNA and it rearranged its genome immediately without thousands or million, millions of failed trials, which is an absolutely fascinating result. Um, John Torday, who you will hear from at this conference, um, discovered that the greatest, the greatest uh, secondhand effect of smoke on children is epigenetic that a daughter will inherit asthma from her smoking mother who will pass it then to a granddaughter who may not have even met the grandmother. And, um, and uh, it is an immediate physical adaptation which is past progeny. Um, therefore, organisms anticipate the future and evolve proactively. Both of these experiments clearly show this. Another unsolved problem in biology is consciousness and agency. Um, what is consciousness? Organisms get their ability to act as agents. Um, uh, Dennis Noble uh, has written about something that Darwin pointed out in 1871, which is that since um, partners choose their mates, then cognition and consciousness is an active part of the evolutionary process. It's, um, and, and, and so this is a major uh, aspect of evolution. It, it, it couldn't possibly be construed as a minor aspect. Uh, James Shapiro wrote a paper two years ago called All Living Cells Are Cognitive, in which he makes a very robust and rigorous case that literally just that, all living cells possess cognition. And the definition I'm using is the mechanisms by which animals acquire, process, store, and act on information from the environment. These include perception, learning, memory, and decision making. Um, so Barbara McClintock, like I mentioned before, she discovered that act cells actively restructure their genomes, and that is a cognitive process. Epigenetics um, is uh, also a cognitive process. Uh, Henry Hang uh, is a member of our Cancer and Evolution Working Group, and he observes that cancer cells, especially when attacked by chemo and radiation, massively rearrange their genomes in order to evade the effects of the chemotherapy. And that is an active cognitive process. And, um, and, and if you look through uh, the evolution literature, uh, if you go deep in it, you'll find many examples of new species in weeks or months, not uh, decades or eons. Um, another cognitive aspect of evolution is self or non-self identification in bacteria and cancer, which also is a basis of our immune systems. Your immune system knows what's you and what's not. Uh, back to um, all living cells are cognitive by Shapiro. Um, another definition of cognition by Belushka and Levin. Levin is on this program later in the next day or two. Cognition refers to this total set of mechanisms and processes that underlie information acquisition, storage, processing, and use and use at any level of organization. And cognition manifests agency, which is exclusive to biology. Cronin and Walker pointed out that uh, biology is the only known source of agency in the universe. And um, they also point out that neither physical laws nor random interactions make choices. And Barbara McClintock asked in her Nobel Prize speech, what does a cell know about itself? I think that's one of the most important questions in the history of science. 
And I think it's only been in the last few years that the scientific world has seemingly turned its attention finally to that question. And then there's the unsolved problem of artificial intelligence, which is that all artificial intelligence is artificial. Any six-year-old can figure out in about three minutes that Siri is as dumb as a box of rocks. And everybody knows it. Uh, general intelligence does not exist in machines, uh, but animals have universal adaptive learning. Um, computers do not. Um, and all genetic algorithms, for example, require goals from humans to be programmed in. And they're not a major tool for software de developers, and they certainly do not rival biology. I believe if we understood biology, we could have agency. Well, I would like to call your attention to the proposal that there are three levels of causation in nature. Uh, the bottom level is physico-chemical laws, like the laws of physics and thermodynamics. Um, matter, energy, light, heat, fields and waves, weather, stars, planets. And the change over time is order to disorder, which is entropy. Uh, the second level of causation, one up from that, is information or computation, or also logic. And that is symbols, communication, computation, languages, machines, algorithms, and genetics. No one knows how to derive any of these things from the law of, laws of physics, and they are driven by freely chosen local rules. So a computer running Mac OS is running on a different set of rules than a computer running Windows, which is running on a different set of rules than uh, Solaris. And those rules are local to that machine. Um, similarly, Chinese is a different set of local rules than English, and PHP is a different local rule than Ruby on Rails. Computation, very important point, computation is deductive and deterministic. There's one output for a given input. And codes are subject to noise, which is information entropy, which we talked about earlier. Then there is the highest level of cause and effect, which is cognition or choice which is agency, action of self-interest, it's meaning, it's assigning meaning, it's creating codes, which is a different thing than computation, as I will show. Cognition is inductive reasoning, as opposed to deductive reasoning. All of the other levels that I talked about are all based on deductive reasoning, but this is inductive. So inductive reasoning is the question of the black swan. If you've only seen white swans, are there black swans? It's the ability to hypothesize that there's a black swan even if you've never seen one. And the change over time in cognition is disorder to order, which is Schrodinger's neg entropy. And so I put it um, in a in a pyramid structure, and this is patterned after the OSI seven layer model in electrical engineering, where you have chemistry at the bottom, you have information and communication in the middle, and you have cognition at the top. Now, the standard story that you're always told in most textbooks is that the world started with physics and chemistry. It eventually created codes through a self-replicating RNA strand or, or a warm pond or, or a lucky lightning strike, and that led to cognition. I would like to point out to you that there's no evidence in the literature for either of these steps. It is always assumed it has never been proved. I have never in my entire uh, 18 years of studying this problem, ever seen any evidence that physics and chemistry produce codes, and I've never seen any evidence in my engineering experience that codes produce cognition. What I've seen in all empirical fact is cognition generates codes, and that codes control physics and chemistry and biology. That is what we can empirically demonstrate. Don't know of any exceptions. If anybody knows of any, I would like you to contact me and I'd like to hear about it. 
Um, and this is why we put together Prize. And um, Dennis Noble's on our judging panel, George Church at Harvard's on our judging panel, Michael Roos at, uh, at uh, Florida State University. It's been written up in various places like the Financial Times. But the previous slide indicates Biology has gotten cause and effect backwards for 100 years. And so I would like to walk you through a process of thinking. If we apply Turing mathematics and Gödel's incompleteness theorem to this problem, we can make a set of equivalencies. Negative information entropy and assigning meaning to symbols and choices and goals and evolution are all driven by the same thing as are axioms in mathematics. If you go to the foundations of mathematics, all deduction comes from axioms. Axioms can't be deduced. Consensus on scientific laws, which is inductive reasoning. All of these things are equivalent to Turing's halting problem, which says that you don't know if the solution is going to be found until you crunch the numbers and find it. And so Turing's halting problem is always set up whenever you are guessing whether something will work or not. When you're guessing whether a path will be maximally effective or not. All of these are undecidable propositions in Kurt Gödel's language, which require goals. And that means that life makes decisions that are impossible to compute. Now, all of you are familiar with Maxwell's demon, and I want to point out something about Maxwell's demon that usually never gets noticed, is that if we're going to separate the cold molecules from the hot molecules, we have to decide which side is going to get the hot ones. And that's a decision and it's not computable. It's a cognitive choice. We could set up an algorithm to carry out the decision once it's been made, but, the, but you have to choose whether A or B gets hot. And so what I'm showing you on the screen is a computer science equivalent of Maxwell's demon which I call a volitional Turing machine. So a Turing machine only obeys its program and it only deduces by definition. This goes to the, this goes to the very most fundamental foundations of mathematics itself and Turing machines. But what everybody's trying to get AI to do is make a choice. And so I am modeling a volitional Turing machine as a program that produces an output of ones and zeros, where at the last step, you get to decide whether you flip the one to a zero or the zero to a one. It's a model of free choice. And we're going to have to have this before we actually have AI. And the only way to do this is for the system to be capable of inductive reasoning. Now, um, so neither thermodynamic nor infor information entropy have goals, but neg negative entropy does have goals and it has direction. And so therefore it has teleonomy or teleology or agency which I'm defining as multiple attempts at the same goal despite unpredictable obstacles. So negative, negative entropy, I want to be very clear, is about information. It's not about energy. And neg entropy is measured in bits, just like everything else in communication. So a coin toss, which introduces randomness, is one bit of entropy. But making a choice, like saying, okay, call it in the air, and you say heads, that is one unit of neg entropy. Because you have decided to assign meaning to a symbol. And so you have created information by doing that, which 
harkens to Dennis Noble's concept of harnessing stochasticity. So I'm going to run through a proof very quickly. I can't go through the details of it, but it's all on my slides. It's also in a paper that I wrote in Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology last year. I'm just going to go through the highlights. So this is the proof. First, math functions in computer programs are equivalent and deterministic. That is Turing's discovery. Deterministic Turing machines are deductive. Adding randomness to Turing machines generates ent information entropy, not negative entropy. It adds more uncertainty to the system, not less. Um, which is to say that you can't solve the problems of computer determinism simply by adding randomness. Adding randomness to a computer program does not make it automatically smart. And furthermore, there's a severe limitations to the number of useful statements that can be generated by randomness. Um, if you have more than 42 bytes of information, it will take 10 to the power of 100 random trials to generate that information. So if you're going to use randomness to generate options in a computer program, you have to choose the decision points very carefully, and you have to have very few of them because otherwise you're just going to end up with garbage. Neg entropy requires agency. Now, there are, th this gets us right back to the question of where did the genetic code come from? Because as far as we know, that's our first instance of where did the first coded information come from on Earth? Well, there are five possible examples, so let's talk through them. Time travel is possible and humans design the genetic code. That's one answer. Extraterrestrials designed the genetic code. The genetic code emerged randomly and accidentally. There are unknown laws or emergent properties of physics and chemistry or five divine intervention. Well, let's take those in turn. I don't consider number one to be possible. Uh, number two only kicks the can down the road. Number three is not a testable hypothesis and it violates information entropy and it does not qualify as science, even though many people seem to be content with that as an answer. Um, I consider five to be possible, but I greatly wish to avoid God of the gaps arguments, um, which I talk about in my book, Evolution 2.0. And furthermore, that all the code precedes cognition, which I have already argued is not correct. That leaves us with option four. There are unknown laws or emergent properties of physics and chemistry that produce negative entropy, and we do not know what they are. Um, and I believe that those things are synonymous with cognition and agency. And so, uh, therefore, generating mathematical axioms um, by definition is inductive reasoning, and that requires choice. So, therefore, all computation is a product of agency, which means life is a product of agency. Um, we know um, biology is the only known source of agency in the universe. I mentioned that. And uh, the agency or negentropy exhibited by life is not matched by computers or any other man made machines that we know. Therefore, biology is not Turing machines and biology transcends the limits of computation. Now, this is a statistical proof, not a deductive proof, because I invoked the law of entropy. But to the extent that entropy is valid, this is a proof. That leads me to the conclusion that evolution is not random events, it is responses to random events. And evolution required, relies on principles of cognition that we do not yet understand. So I believe that cause and effect in biology is cognition first, code second, chemicals third. And um, here's how you falsify the model that I have given you today. Any experiment that demonstrates that chemicals produce codes with no assistance from biology, in other words, you can't cheat. Or, any experiment that demonstrates that codes produce cognition. 
with no assistance from biology will count. Now, when Isaac Newton had that apple fall out of the tree and bump him on the head, and he had the realization that, hey, that thing that pulls apples out of the trees is the same thing that causes the moon to circle the earth. That was a giant epiphany of connecting two seemingly unrelated things. And in a similar fashion, I would like to propose that negative entropy and origin of life and evolution and AI and consciousness are not five problems, they are one problem. And the one problem is, what is the origin and nature of cognition? Now, what are the implications of this? It means it's impossible to reduce biology to mathematics. It means that reductionist methods will continue to fail in biology and origin of life and cancer. It says that science itself by this question will be forced to be redefined as something beyond fixed laws. And it also suggests that soft sciences like economics and biology are richer than hard sciences like physics and chemistry and electrical engineering. I'm an electrical engineer. It suggests that we are missing laws of physics, and these are not like the prior laws, but they are principles of agency. Um, it implies that your goldfish is smarter than Alexa or Siri, and AI is all A and no I. There is no real AI. And uh, it, it suggests that the Ray Kurzweil's singularity is not going to happen until we solve this. And it implies that the search problem is a quest for the next Nikola Tesla or Albert Einstein, and we are looking for that person. And if you know that person, I want to meet him. And my references are on the last slide. So let's take some questions. Uh, thank you very for a great talk and also uh, giving some more information about the prize you have set up and definitely I hope that some from our group or at least the patron of the thermodynamics 2.0 conference would be able to answer that question somewhere. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to open this floor for questions. Uh, please, uh, if you have a question, uh, please speak out, unmute yourself, and speak directly to Terry. Terry, uh, you have. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, uh, Terry, I, I really like your talk. I think you're right. You're on to uh, a, 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 what I would call a deep analysis, and. Uh, and uh, going in the right direction, but I think, and, and I think you see that uh, uh, you can't get here from there. <laughs> in other words, if you start with the assumption that the world is made of, you know, uh, somehow what the, the particle physicists and so forth would tell us, you're not going to get from there to code, and you're not going to get from code to cognition. It's not going to happen. So, what is a possible thing here? So, and you see, and you do see that agency is crucial. So you might, well, I would say you can, you hopefully will benefit from listening to my talks, but I'm uh, looking forward. yes. Yeah. What I did is, uh, so I, I uh, started in science, philosophy of science, and I morphed over into philosophy of engineering. <clears throat> and what goes on in that transition is all of a sudden you begin to look at the world uh, through the ideas of engine, through the concepts of engineering. And what that does is it says the ontology of the world is actually cognitive from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't, uh, so, and it's, it's what I call a bigger tent. So it's a more general framework. And all the sciences, I think, as you were saying, they need to be fixed, become special cases, become tools for the engineer. And uh, so anyway, I think you're on the right track, but I think the move you have to make is just to move over to the to an engineering framework to engineering specifically say well how does the world look to in the in terms of engineering and engineering concepts this applies to thermodynamics of course which is what my talk here on today is about but uh anyway i really like your talk i'll maybe send you a note on some of this stuff but uh, you're on the right track uh you've you've certainly analyzed the, the problem uh appropriately 
So thank you. Well, well, Terry, I just want to say, I think in science, the gold standard should not be peer review. It should be engineering. Can you build it and does it work? You know, Feynman said, that which I cannot build, I do not understand. And, um, you know, just because a bunch of journal editors think it sounds good doesn't mean it's true. And I, I think we need to raise our standards. And so philosophy and engineering sounds like we have a great beer together. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, just one recommendation for you. Uh, you might take a look at, uh, uh, there's a book by Walter Vincente, who was an engineer out of Stanford. And he has a book called What Engineers Know and How They Know It. Hmm. And he, he, really, he goes on and says, you know, the idea that engineering is applied science uh, just doesn't cut it. And, um, and so then he has a whole, he develops things out of there. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other references I give you, but you might start with that to get a sense of what the philosophy of the modern philosophy of engineering, where it comes from. There are a lot of people uh, in that uh, game, uh, including myself. Uh, but start, I would say start with Vincente and you'll get a, an idea. Thank you. Well, science is applied in yeah, science is applied engineering, and all engineering it, it not only requires science but it requires imagination, as your iPhone is very much. I mean, there, there's a lot of imagination and brainstorming and creativity in this device, not just analysis. That that's the point that Vincenti's making. <laughs> yes. I think we, we have a little bit flexibility here. We started our launch time. Of if you need to go for the launch time, feel free to do that. But because there is so many interests in the room, I'm going to take the next question. Uh, Anthony, please unmute yourself and ask directly to Perry. Hi, Anthony. Yes, hi. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, raise a question. I liked your talk. It was excellent. I think it was uh, very insightful. Um, however, I'd like you to make reference to another Marshall, Alfred Marshall, who wrote The Principles of Economics. And he wrote this in 1890s. And he said that this is in his introduction to his principles. He said that the mecca of economics is not mathematics, but biology. In other words, but we use mathematical terms because that's much simpler to explain problems than biology because of the complexity. But he already said that in 1890s when he was introducing economics. And I think this is an issue that has been prevalent in the social sciences because we do use mathematics, but we use it as a statistical methodology, really, because we, tr we, we, we live in a complex world, not a complex, in complexity. And we try to simplify our complexity. And now we recognize that the act of simplifying complexity is that we lose knowledge. And I think what we're exploring right now is exactly the opposite, to bring back complexity into the system itself, into understanding the system and uh, the complex systems that so we're dealing with. I, I, have just... a story, I have a story about that. So yeah, yeah. Dennis Noble organized an evolution conference at the Royal Society in 2016. Right. And I went to that. And on the very first morning before it started, I sat down and the guy next to me happened to be an economist. And I said, so what are you doing here? And he goes, he goes um, this conference is about something that we ac economists figured out 20 years ago and the biologists are just now catching up. Uh, and and what you just said is, well, actually it wasn't 2016 or 20 years before that, it was actually 1890. And I, I agree, I, I believe I'm a business person uh, by profession, and I believe that business is biology and biology is business. I, I think the two are really the same thing, uh, just at two different levels of scale. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, Dennis, uh, uh, your next bit. Hi, yes. Dennis. A very quick point. Um, I'd like just to clarify something which I think is important, although it's a footnote to what Barry Marshall has just brilliantly expounded. Um, we've had two presentations now that seriously take to task what we call neo-Darwinism. I just want to make the point that neo-Darwinism is not Darwinism. In his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin clearly sided with those 
who thought that conscious agency was a characteristic of living organisms, not just man, but also animals. He specifically referred to this in his 1871 book. I think, ideally, I would like the neo-Darwinists to stop using Darwin's name. That's my point. Very good. Uh, next, Arthur, can you please unmute yourself and <coughs> directly to Perry? Perry, it seems to me that you call after agency, that is to say, purpose or teleology. What prevents you from seeing that all systems are on their way toward balance in their circumstances? They want to gain balance in their surroundings. Well, that is what I define as agency. You know, my car is parked in the parking garage and none of the cars in the parking garage evolve. They decay. But the bacteria and the weeds in the parking garage evolve. So why is it, what is it that enables bacteria to evolve and cars, radios, computers, and houses do not? There's well, something missing. Well, bacteria have the means, the mechanisms, the to gain balance in the surroundings that are energy rich for the bacteria, whereas the cars don't have it. Well, all of the engineers would like to design their cars to have that, but we don't know how. So what is it we don't know? Well, you, you need to tap in the car into the <clears throat> surrounding energy sources like the, like the electric supplies. Okay, so will plugging my car into the electrical grid cause it to evolve? Uh, I think this discussion will need more time than we currently have. Therefore, I will give a quick time to John Torde for his question. John, please. Oh, I actually have an answer, not a question. So Perry knows my work very well, as does Dennis Noble. So I, I've spent 50 years as an empiricist and um, finally just uh, realized that I could reduce compl complicated physiology to a unicellular state and did an, an important experiment about 20 years ago showing that in microgravity a cell loses its identity. So gravity is actually the energy that initiated uh, life. And what I'm driving at is that I decided that there were three components to physiology. Uh, first principles of physiology. There's neg negative entropy that Perry talked about chemiosmosis, which provides the energy source, but it's all controlled by homeostasis. I believe, I think that homeostasis is what you're talking about, Perry, as agency, but maybe you can address that. Well, I, I do think homeostasis is agency. Um, you could almost define a living organism as something with a boundary that decides what it's going to let in and keep out. And so not only are cells living organisms, but so are universities because they reject students that don't meet the application requirements and they reject faculty members that aren't going to do a good job teaching, right? And so, and so um, cognition is going on at every level of biology. There's even plausible arguments that viruses have cognition, although that, that's a very fuzzy question, uh, as I think most people can appreciate. So yeah, I think, see, I think all these things are one question. They're not seven or eight questions. Right. And, and maybe right. that at least simplifies our quest. Yeah, but I, I would take to task the idea that a university is the same. It's, it's composed of organisms, sure, but it's not servoed to the gravitational effect of the cosmos. Living organisms are. Well, but all of the living organisms that make up the university are subject to gravitation. So if gravitation is a key component of agency or cognition or consciousness, then, um, well, so, I, and I don't know how to respond beyond what you just said, because uh, you, you and I have talked many times and I think your, your model is very interesting and I, I think you should pursue it. And I don't understand it as well as you do, so. Just quickly, so the university is a top-down system. It, it's not a self-organizing, it's not a Maturana, Varela autopoetic mechanism. That's what you need. Uh, universities could be like that, sure, but they, that's not how they normally behave. Right? Well, that would be a whole very interesting uh, socioeconomics question, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sode. And uh, I think it's the time to take a small uh, pause. And 
after uh, I think it's a time for a launch, but let's take a break and we'll start the next talk after five minutes.